how were games made in 1987? That is an interesting question, and I'm going to explore it in this video. The game I'm going to discuss is The Maze of Gallius, made by Konami in, you guessed it, 1987. And it's a pretty standard platform game, which you're probably familiar with if you're watching this video. But if not, then uh, I'll show you enough screens from the game that you can get an idea of what it is. Most people who are going to discuss a game will start up the game and then look at what happens on screen. And that is definitely interesting, but I want to take a different approach. So what I'm going to do is to look at the actual code, the ROM file that is in the cartridge. I'm analyzing it and figuring out what happens based on the source of that information in the ROM file. Let's first take a look at what is in the memory. The MSX computer that the game runs on has 64 kilobytes of memory and it is split up into some parts which you are probably familiar with. I made a model of it but then I decided I won't use it because uh, that would just be boring if everyone already knows it. But some of you may not be familiar with the contents of a Konami Mega ROM cartridge. There is a megabit of information in there, in other words 128 kilobytes, and that information is pretty much split up into six parts. There's page zero, which contains the things that always need to be accessible, and then there's five blocks of 24 kilobytes each, which can be mapped in and out of view. And in fact, each block consists of three pages that can separately be mapped, but that is irrelevant for this discussion. So what is in all those pages? Well, page zero obviously contains things that need to always be accessible. So that is the code for switching the pages, that is also some uh, code mostly just for running the game. Then the other five blocks, uh, that is interesting, what's in there? Well, the first uh, two, that's pages one, two, three, and pages four, five, six, seem to contain mostly code, so part of running the game. Then the other three seem to be mostly data, and um, the parts that I found have been 789, which is room data, uh, ABC, I have actually not seen what it's for, but it does seem to be mostly data, which suggests that it's probably the sound and music, because I didn't look for that, and so there needs to be a lot of data somewhere to, uh, to encode for that, and it's probably there. And then finally, DEF uh, is where the characters are stored, so I'll explain a bit more about that in the next section. The game is using screen 2. What that means is that it is a character-based game, like every MSX game pretty much, uh, and so all of the graphics are stored in patterns of 8x8 eight eight pixels, which are usually called characters. Every pattern has uh, 8 lines, obviously, and every line can have 2 colors, and then a pattern for which pixels will be the foreground and which pixels will be the background of those two colors. And that, of course, is a challenge for the artists who do the designs. And in this game, I have to say, I am extremely impressed. They have uh, used this system with its limitations to create things that look like they should not be possible. Uh, with lots of colors next to each other that you think, how do they do that? And then you zoom in and you see, oh right, it just fits. For example, the items are 16 pixels wide. So every half item has this limitation of only two colors. And if you look, for example, at the water and bread item, you see that the bread is positioned such that in the place where it is just about to overlap with the water is exactly the boundary between the characters so that uh, it still works and the colors do not cause problems. So that is very well done and very well designed in general. Here with the salt, we have a similar thing where they wanted to have this corner here a bit cut off, but that means, of course, you get this extra color here on this pixel, and that only works if you do not have any black on the other side, which conveniently they have managed to achieve by making the thing reach exactly the side of the character, so there is no black on this line. There are many more examples of such impressive work, and I really recommend you look through the characters with this limitation in mind to see how well they have done this because it's really impressive. Before I'll talk about the data and the map that I've created, I want to say a few things 
about the structure of the program itself. The way it runs is using a state machine based on the screen interrupt. So the program just sits and does nothing, and every time the screen is done drawing, it will get an interrupt, and then it suddenly does things. When it's done, it will wait again for the next interrupt. Now, the things it does is done using a state machine. So it has a state, and based on that state, it will actually jump to a different piece of code. So whenever something big needs to happen, like you walk to another room, then what it does is it will change the state, and then the next interrupt, it will run a completely different piece of code so that it's actually ready to, uh, to continue. So then it will do the right thing, the next interrupt. And one thing that's been annoying me throughout my analysis is that the game uses one-based lists all over the place. They pretty much have zero reserved for, uh, well, not used or sometimes for invalid. But uh, that means, for example, that the castle is encoded as world number one. And you think there is a world one there as well. Yes, it has code number two. And world three has code number four, etc. So that is really annoying, uh, but well, what can you do? That's how they made the game. And of course it doesn't give any problems while running, so you wouldn't notice it. When making a map, of course, the important thing is what is going to be drawn on screen. So it's important to understand how the video RAM is mapped. There are two different types of things on screen, namely the patterns, also called characters, and the sprites. Both of them have definitions for how they look and some instructions about where they are. The how they look part is the generator and that has for the patterns, or the characters, that's the background pretty much of the screen. It has a pattern generator table and a color table. As I said before, the pattern generator defines which bits or which pixels are foreground and background the color table defines what color is the foreground and what color is the background. And because every line can have a different foreground and background, that means that it is a pretty large table. Actually, both of them are pretty large. Together, they are more than half of all the video memory that is available. Sprites, on the other hand, are little images of one color which are floating on top of the screen. These sprites also have a pattern generator table, which defines how they look, but they do not have a color table because they are only a single color. So their color is not a table, it's just a number. So when we look on the screen, what do we see? Well, first the patterns or characters. Every position on screen is a character. And so there is a table which just lists all of the positions and for each position, it tells you which character is there and then it reads it from the pattern generator and the color table to show what actually are the colors of the pixels. There are only a limited number of sprites, so there is not a table for every position what sprite is there, because not everywhere is a sprite. Instead, you have a table of sprites, which tells you where they are, what color they are, and what shape they have, so what name they have, as it's called in the video processor. So how does this game do the displaying? Modern games would create the entire screen and then flip it. So they say, I will build this entire image uh, while it is drawing something else. Uh, so it's not actually on screen. And then when it's done, I will just exchange it and say, okay, now this is the new screen you need to show next frame. That does not work on the MSX. And uh, the reason is there's just not enough memory for it. Also, if you want to change all the characters to the patterns, that is actually a lot of memory to transfer to the video processor. And it's just too slow. You cannot do that every frame. However, what you can do every frame is transferring only the pattern name table and the sprite attribute table. As you can see, they are quite small, and so that is not a problem. And that is exactly what this game is doing. So while the video processor is busy drawing the screen, the CPU is filling a copy of the name table and the sprite attribute table with the values that will be used for the next frame. When it's done, on the next interrupt, the first thing it does is it will copy all those things back into the video RAM so that they will be used on the next frame draw. Why is this useful? Well, the main memory that the processor accesses 
is way more flexible than video memory and much faster. So what you can do is you can first draw some things on screen like the background and then you just replace some parts. You put a shrine on it, you put an object on it, you maybe put some boulders on it, you add some letters and then it's done and then you send it to the video processor. So it makes it all a lot easier to create the screen that you want without having the problem that it might suddenly be drawing while you're computing and then you see half of the things that shouldn't be visible. Like you have an item inside a boulder, then you want to see only the boulder and not accidentally sometimes reveal the item a little. To figure out what was happening, the first thing I did was figure out what was written to the video RAM. So I found the characters that were being filled, so the pattern generator table and the color table, through some function that is meant for doing that. It reads some compressed data, some run length encoded, it's not very complex. And uh, so I just looked through the code for all the calls to that function. And that way I could regenerate all of the character sets by just redoing what the video processor does pretty much. So that gives me this nice list of characters. And of course in the system it will never have all of them in video RAM at once. It will only have one line of characters and whenever something is loaded it will be replacing whatever was there. And in practice it will load several of these sets at once and then some characters are the result of that and they can be used on screen. One interesting thing you see here is that there are a lot of characters reserved for the vitality and experience bars. So how does that work? And actually why does that work? Because if you look at this uh, thing during the game, it looks like it's actually moving one pixel at a time and that should not be possible with characters. So that's why they did this trick. Very nice and it works well. To build such a bar, it starts with an end cap on the right side of a character. It's an otherwise black character, so that there's really just the end cap. That is useful because then from there on, it is just a repeating pattern of eight pixels of health bar or experience. Now suppose that the actual value of the health is five. That means you want five colored pixels and the rest black. Well, we have a character that does exactly that. So we can just put that character in and then we have the correct value for the health length. If it's more than eight characters, then we first put in a full bar of eight pixels and then we fill it up with the rest. And so on, you can make any length of bar that you want. But there is also a line for the maximum of the bar. So how does that work? Well, we have this special bar, which is empty, except it has a line on the left side. And if you put that in at the place where you want the maximum, then obviously there will be a line in your bar but the bar will continue on. And so at the very end, you want an end cap, just like the starting cap, uh, which is just a line and then otherwise black character. So all of those you see in the characters that are defined and they are used exactly as such. But of course, that means that the maximum value for vitality and experience can only ever be a multiple of eight pixels because this character with the maximum bar in it has the bar always in the same place in the character. Is that a problem? Well, um, it could be, but not if you just make sure you do always have your maximum at a multiple of eight pixels, which is what this game did. So I thought I had found all of the characters and then I was looking at shrines and I saw, oh, look, there's this nice yellow wall around it. Let's find it in the character map. And I looked, and I looked, and I could not find it. So apparently this wall was somehow made in a way that I had missed. How is that possible? Well, it took a while, but I did find out. Why, oh why, did they do this this way? They created a regular wall, and then they hard-coded a replacement for the color table for the wall, just for the shrines. They could have just put it in a different character, and encoded it normally like everything else, but for some reason they decided it was fun to make it a very special case only for this specific character, where there was no reason to do so. I will never understand programmers. In the game, most of the enemies are sprites and most of the background is characters. And that is all fine, because then the enemies can move uh, with one pixel at a time, 
while of course the background is stationary anyway and it can be nice and colorful. But in this game they decided that sometimes they wanted to have really colorful enemies as well. Example of that is the Moai statues that uh, shoot those rings at you. And the way they made them is by using characters. It's really simple really and it works really well. But there are more character enemies and they are pretty impressive. Those are the world bosses. They are all made of characters and they are pretty big. So they move around the screen and they change a lot of characters while they do. An interesting part about this is how such a boss fight works. You enter a room with a huge symbol on the wall, and then you enter a password and the screen is flashing and it goes black and it gets really spooky and, and it's like you're in a dungeon and it's really cool. Now the question is why did they do that? Is it because it's really cool? Probably, but also because they really needed to. Why is that? Well, the monsters, the boss, those are characters. And they can only move 8 pixels at a time, because they move whole characters. So that means that if you have a background, and you have it somehow written into your boss, then it will always move 8 characters at a time, so your, your background needs to be repeating in a pattern of only one character, which is kind of ugly. So instead, what they did is they removed the entire background from the boss, and so you have a big black rectangle with a boss in it. Now that would be even more ugly if you put that on top of a screen with background. But if you put it on top of a black screen, then it looks fine. It's just a boss moving around over the black background. So that is what they did, which looks really cool, but it also is the only way they could make it work. The rooms are stored in the ROM in a way that you might not expect. There is a lot of them. And so there are limitations on how much you can store per room, because otherwise it just doesn't fit in the ROM. The worst way to do it would be to define every room's characters separately. That would cost you about 1.6 megabytes, and so that does not fit at all. Also, it's not a good way to do it, because it's really inefficient to use if you have it stored that way. So the obvious solution is to not store the patterns, but just store the characters. So you have, well, obviously you need to store what the patterns look like, but you do that once. And then for every room, you just store which characters are in that room at which position. Now that sounds like a good solution, except it is still way too large. If you do that, it will take you about 120 kilobytes. In other words, the entire ROM image. And then you don't have a game yet, you just have the rooms. To make it even smaller, they divided the room into tiles of 4x4 four four characters. So that's 16 characters each, and every tile just gets a number. There's a total of about 100 tiles, and so every number is just one byte. That way, with all of the rooms we have, the whole thing takes about 30 kilobytes. That's 20 kilobytes for the characters, and the rest is for defining the tiles and actually sh giving the tiles of the rooms. That is slightly larger than it absolutely needs to be, because they have duplicated some of it. And that is because it's useful. They have duplicated the characters. They have not just defined one character set, but they have defined several. And every room not only says, these are the tiles in here, but it also says, this is the tile set that is being used, or actually the character set. So you have, for example, these rooms that have the blue bricks, you have the rooms with the green leaves, and of course you have the rooms in the worlds. So there's in total eight different types of room that you could have, and each room defines which characters it uses and which tiles are therefore useful for it, and then it uses those tiles and characters to actually build the screen. So that gives you more variation. Originally, I was just looking for a single room in the game. That's why I started this whole project. But once I had that later, I thought, well, why not look at all the other things that are on screen as well? So I looked at elevators, I looked at boulders, I looked at shrines, and I found pretty much all of it. So what did I find? Well, the elevators, for starters, the vertical ones are actually running no matter where in the castle you are. They keep updating their position, and if they enter your room or uh, move in your room, they will be shown in the correct position. This is different from the horizontal elevators, which are created when you enter a room, and they are always created on the leftmost position that it takes. So when you enter a room, all the horizontal elevators are on the left, 
but the vertical ones will just be wherever they are because they keep being updated. When looking for trap walls, so those walls that appear when you walk past them, I found that they are actually stored in a list of several special things, which includes disappearing letters and uh, walls that you can hit with your sword to destroy and uh, some more. So that was actually interesting. There's a list of all those things in all the worlds and whenever a room is listed on that list, then something special is happening there. So that is an efficient way to not have to worry about making several lists which all have their own overhead, but instead just storing it in one, and that saves some bytes. And that is a common theme throughout the code here, that saving bytes is really important, because you don't have that many of them. Boulders, on the other hand, do have their own list, because there are so many of them. So for every room, there is a list of which boulders are in this room and uh, where they are. But that list is only available for the castle. So I didn't really notice this before I found it in the code. But when I saw it, I realized, yes, indeed, in all of the worlds, there are no boulders. The only place where there are boulders is in the castle. Except, of course, for the final room where you find the baby in a boulder. So what's happening there? Well, that is actually quite interesting. Those boulders are not the same as the boulders in the castle. The boulders in there are enemies. They are regular enemies just like others, and they are drawn using characters just like the suits of armor and the Moai statues. So they just happen to look exactly like boulders because that's how they made them look. And they also behave that if you hit them with your sword, then uh, they will change into something else. They look like they're breaking and then uh, this uh, ball comes out that hopefully doesn't kill you. That of course also implies that regular boulder techniques do not work on them. So having the harp does not mean you can destroy all of them in one slash with the sword. Also, if Aphrodite hits a boulder with a sword, it just takes her three uh, stabs and not 15 because it is not a boulder, it is just an enemy which needs to be hit three times. So having found all of that information, I made a map of the whole system. Now, how did I do that? Well, obviously, all the screens I could create and generate an image for them. But then I need to stitch them together somehow. And the game does not say this map is at this coordinate because it doesn't actually have world coordinates. It just has coordinates within the screen. So how do you know which room goes to which room? Well, they say so. In the ROM, obviously, when you walk out of a room, it will tell you which other room you're walking into. So using that information, I have stitched the whole thing together and ended up with almost this image. Almost because I had to do some manual insertion. What is happening? After stitching, I ended up with two different images. One of them, the entire castle minus one room, and this separate room was not actually connected to anything. No room says it goes there and it doesn't say it goes anywhere. So where do I put it? Well, I will look at the numbers because every room has a number. The starting room is number one and it has been swapped with the top room in the image. If you would swap it back, then actually all of the rooms are in order. So starts at the top and then from left to right on the next row and the next and the next and so on. The entire castle is all numbered in order, except for two rooms which are also swapped for some reason. But let's ignore that. With this ordering, it is absolutely obvious where the disconnected room needs to go. Namely, right between the other two numbers that it neighbors. And if you put it there, indeed there is a gap, so that's good. And um, there is another reason why you would expect it to be there. The entire castle is completely symmetric, except that there is one very hidden room. That's the one where you find the cross that you need to destroy Gallius. Now this room does not seem to have a mirror room. And that means that if you didn't find this hidden room, and you see that the castle is symmetric, then you wouldn't get a hint of where you need to look. But apparently there actually is a mirror image of this room, which is the disconnected room. You can't actually go there, 
but it is really there. They did make it and uh, they didn't use it, obviously. By the way, if you cheat yourself into the room, which of course is possible, then you will see that it is completely filled with brick, as I have also generated. Uh, and also there is a coin there for some reason and there's stuff flying through it. I have later found that the stuff flying through it is uh, those vertical blobs which attach to any ceiling they find. Except here there are no ceilings, so they're just flying. They also have the wrong shape because they are not loaded for this room. Every sprite needs to be loaded before it is used. And in this room it is not recorded that it needs the vertical blob shapes. So it looks like they originally were planning to use this room for something, then they decided not to and they pretty much abandoned it in a state where it wasn't usable. Which is fine, it wasn't used anyway. So that's cool, that is one extra mystery that I have solved. Are there other reasons that this map might be nice or useful? Oh yes, definitely. This way of creating a map allows you to separate all the different parts. If you compare it to making screenshots, in a screenshot obviously you can only put the things on there that were actually on the screen. What I did here for example is I made all of the beds white. They would have been black if I would have taken this value from the code, but I wanted them to be white so that they are really visible. Because if you want to use the map for playing the game, it's actually useful to know that you're walking into a room full of beds. And when they are black and hiding in cracks, as they are meant to be sort of invisible in the game, they are hard to see, and that's really annoying because then you walk into them. The best way to do this would be to actually use a layered output format, where you can also uh, enable and disable the different layers. The text here could be actual text instead of pixels, and that would just make the output nicer. So that would be cool. Right now I have just made a pixel image, where everything is a single layer, but it would be possible with this system to split it out into several others and it might actually be useful. One final note on the shrines that you can enter where the gods are. I have, as I said before, also looked at those and one thing I found was that there's a list of messages they can say. When it draws a shrine it will first draw the background and then there's a number for which god is in there and it draws the image and the name of that. And then there's a number for which message the god is saying and then it will just draw that message. The interesting thing is you can, of course, just go down the list and print all the messages, which is what I did. And then you find one message which isn't actually ever used in the game. So they have created all the messages, and then they've used all the messages, and then they've changed something, and one of them got left behind. Still defined in there, but not being used. So we can do some speculation on what that was supposed to mean, and it looks like it uh, points to a thing that they have changed in how the game works. But I don't have the details about that. Thank you for watching. Please, if you liked this video, then tell me about it in the comments. Tell me what you liked, and specifically tell me what else you would like to see. One thing I'm kind of planning is to do a similar deconstruction of a different game, and then actually record the work while I'm doing it. If you would be interested in that, then let me know which game you think might be suitable for it. And then I might consider that. That was it for this video. Thanks again for watching and take care everyone.